inside. And in the cases, the the artists, the dreamers, the art that makes life worth living, the art that makes life worth living. Welcome, all my weirdos. This is Here Comes the Weirdo Parade, and today's weirdo is Amanda Dussault. Amanda, will you please introduce yourself to our people and tell us in what way or ways you are a weirdo? Uh, well, yes, my name is Amanda Dusso, and I am a weirdo um, in gosh, a lot of different ways. I would say I'm a weirdo in that I recognize as queer and have for a long time. Um, doesn't feel as weird anymore, but I will say those are some of my original weirdos for sure. Um, I would say I'm a weirdo in that I am uh, physically disabled. I have cerebral palsy. Um, and I would say I'm a weirdo in that I, um, I'm mentally divergent. Um, part of that has to do with uh, cerebral palsy being brain damage. And part of that has to do with various mental illnesses. Um, I have PTSD and I also have DID, Dissociative Identity D Disorder. And I would say I'm a weirdo in that I um, probably for more than anything, I'm an artist. <laughs> And that makes me probably weirder than all of those things combined because it is all of those things combined, so. Okay, um, yeah, it should be mentioned, I first met you in connection with the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yes, um, indeed. Has always been a magnet for weirdos. Um, Very much so. <laughs> and, and let me uh, just specify that weirdo in, in our context is not a slur or an insult, but uh, a badge of honor. We are the people that all those other people think are weird in some way or another. Fantastic. And and we need uh, our own parade. I I mean I have always loved a good parade. I belong in one, so I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> well, I, I hope one day if if this uh, takes off, we'll have a literal parade. I think that would be fun. Oh, I'm I'm in. Count me in. <laughs> Uh, can you tell us a bit more about your art and how your weird um sure affects it? So um, I am an artist in a lot of different ways. Um, I will say that mainly I, I identify as a performer. Um, at least that's how most people I think know me, at least in Salt Lake City in Utah. Um, I will say that I am definitely a very weird performer. Um, most people have really never seen anyone like me before. That I think has to do a lot with being disabled, with being physically disabled. Um, but I also think that has a lot to do with my personality. Um, I tend to be very outgoing and do my best to be sincere. And um, that I do think that combination comes off as like fearless, even though that might not necessarily be what it is. And uh, I definitely think that like uh, my weirdness, my disability, it contributes to my performance in a way that I am, at least on the stage, I'm not really scared of much. I will say that. So, and then I will say, uh, I also identify like as an illustrator. Uh, I am a, I guess, doodler. Like I've been doodling for many years now. I would say that uh, being a weirdo definitely contributes to that in terms of like, I mentioned earlier that I identify as mentally divergent. Um, one of the things that I've come to notice about that is uh, I have a response to colors, um, bright, bright colors. For instance, you mentioned my makeup earlier. Uh, it, they're comforting to me. And so that's really displayed in my illustrations and artwork. Um, and yeah, I would say I'm also a writer and I definitely would say that being disabled has informed almost every bit of my writing, um, whether I want it to or not. My perspective of the world is that of a disabled person. And so it contributes in that way. Um, and then I would also say that recently I've been exploring how being queer has contributed to my artwork. I only say recently because uh, in terms of being queer, I've 
I now identify as non-binary, but I didn't have that language for a really long time. And so I would say that that kind of art really displayed itself as like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I found a position where in which I could be any gender I wanted to be, depending on what I wanted to be. So I'm grateful for that. And I'm, I'm grateful that uh, finding art and being queer seemed to mesh very well together in my life, much before I had the language to describe being queer. So I think uh, a lot of people will identify with that, at least um, people who are o older than, than some of the, the younger folks who grew up with mm -hmm. all the labels and language available to them. Absolutely. Um, which I am completely envious of, of that. Um, as a bit of an old fart, I do sometimes read some of the discourse and go, what the fuck yeah. are these people talking about? But more power to them. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't have to go along on your journey to support your journey. Um, and, well, and I think I'm learning new language as a queer. Like, it's definitely like... Uh, like, I think one of the things about being queer in a way is being proud, but also remain, like remaining humble enough to learn new things about your culture as it evolves. And I can definitely say I've been on board with that journey. And like, as an older queer, I'm sure I'm slow sometimes, you know, and I can definitely relate to that pain. <laughs> uh, and, and a note to the younger queer uh, and or LGBTQIA+. B plus um, folks uh, please listen to the elder queers yes um, if if you're born into a culture you learn your culture from your family um, but if you're you're born into queerdom your family is probably not going to help you know uh, the history and the culture and mm -hmm. uh, the trials and tribulations and the discourse mm -hmm. that's gone before um, and particularly generationally, I'm not sure how old you are, but I am the generation that lost an awful lot of queer men. Mm -hmm. um, I, I came of age in the 80s, and uh, that, that's kind of generationally painful. Yeah. So when you find some elder queers, listen to their stories. We, you know... Mm -hmm. You're, you're free to think we're full of shit, but I, I, I do see some uh, some discourse that oh, what was, there was something recently where uh, drawing a blank, but there's like one word that they said, yeah, that was invented by Tumblr. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> no. Uh, the world <laughs> existed before the Internet, believe Way it or before. not. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, I, I agree with you, especially because I also like. Uh, I don't think, I mean, we're still a little ways away from queer history being taught in school. Like, and that's where like the elder queers have really, like they've been extremely important to me in my life because as I would discover knowledge of like, like I remember learning about Stonewall, for instance, in college and like learning then about, you know, that was also probably one of my first introductions to what it really truly meant to be trans suddenly I had a lot of questions and I had nowhere to turn except for the elder queers, you know, Rocky Horror Picture Show, the people who had been living the queer life with, without proper language, I guess, for a long time. And they, I will say one of the things I've learned from elder queers is to be comfortable with not knowing everything yet, like not having the direct answer yet and just simply being. And while I'm very grateful for the language that like the youth have brought to us, I do think that would be one thing I would kind of say to like take a step back, like especially when you're talking to people who, for instance, don't know a lot about queer culture, who may not support it fully yet, a family member who might not support a trans family member. I can say I've had a lot of really good discussions with my brother who I wouldn't say he was exactly transphobic, but my brother, I mean, he used to be against gay marriage way, way, way back in the day. You know, I can say he doesn't feel that way now. And he and I have had some super hard conversations about things like pronouns 
And he will be the first to admit he's been slow to learn the language. But at the same time, by having someone like me who is still, um, I guess the older queer in me is still just okay with, oh, you got it wrong. No big deal. You know what I mean? And I think those conversations are still very important. I believe um, when I first heard your name, it was Amanda fucking Jusso. Yes, indeed. Um, I uh, started kind of going by that, like via stage. Um, <laughs> that's an older story for sure. Um, I used to throw a lot of parties when I was really young. Um, and it's kind of where I learned that I had a knack for picking up different kinds of friends. And I, um, I was throwing this one party and I hung out with a lot of guys all, all the time. And one of my guy friends saw that I had entered the room and he was just super wasted. Right. And he just stood up and he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Amanda fucking do so. And somehow it just like, it was the moment I needed. Cause like, I, I mean, if you can imagine like I'm disabled. So walking in, walking into a house party, everyone's looking at me, everyone can see me and they're all waiting to see what I will do if I need help. What's the deal? So just to have this grand entrance of Amanda fucking do so. It just set the tone somehow for the rest of my like social experience like I don't know it was like a instilled in me this confidence I didn't really know I needed <laughs> do you have um social media you'd like to plug an Instagram anything with your art or your sure. writing yeah sure um so I am on Instagram and I'm AFD doodles that you can follow me there um I do have a, a threadless shop as well and you can find the link on my Instagram um, I am still very new to the whole digital art scene. Um, I'm a classically trained artist and I have self-taught myself how to make digital art. So um, you can find the bare minimum on my shop, but it's definitely a start. <laughs> I guess I'll just kind of plug a project that might come out someday. Um, I am a, a poet. I, I say that with like just the littlest amount of shame because unfortunately I feel like poetry has really gotten a bad rap <laughs> in our modern age. Um, and for good reason, there are a lot of poets and not all of them are good. I will admit I'm a critic as much as an artist. And uh, I do have a book of poetry that I have been working on for quite some time. Um, and I hope to kind of get that out there someday probably a self-publishing thing, which again, I say with just the tiniest amount of shame, <laughs> but uh, someday that might be a thing if people are interested, you know, and to kind of get to know that. And then I do have another project that I have been, I had on the back burner for many years. And I try to say it now in the smallest of venues, because people get really excited for something I have not completed yet. But an idea is I have been writing a memoir of um, my sexual escapades. And it's basically a cripple sex book, if you will. Um, that's something I've worked on for a long time though, and definitely realized I had to be older to get that finished. <laughs> it, you need maturity to enter that topic, I think, and not look like trash. I mean, just to be honest. And uh, I just don't think I had that kind of class in my 20s. So I wish, and I say that proudly because you don't need it yet. If, I mean, I didn't, so, <laughs> but I don't know. I, um, that's still something in the works. Um, it's honestly, so nobody gets nervous. There'll be no names named, nothing like that. But the whole point of the book is just to, um, I would love to be an ambassador for this idea that people with disabilities are sexual creatures. I would, I think a huge part of my upbringing, a huge part of my maturity, um, a huge part of being an adult <laughs> would have been a lot easier for me had I had some sort of, um, I don't know, like some story to turn to when I was a teenager, when I was going through puberty, when I was freshly in college, if I had had some sort of disabled person 
to like read about or to look at and be like, oh, you know, you can have a sexual lifestyle, you can have multiple relationships, you can um, be a free creature and people will desire you. And I just think if I had known that, so many things would have been easier. <laughs> so that's really why I still have that project deep in my heart. <laughs> and I really do hope that I can get to it someday. Yeah, and, and your, your, your mention of, of wishing when you were younger you had seen someone like you, uh, that, that brings up uh, representation as, uh, as a topic. And uh, I think uh, representation across all, I mean, this is a multi-axis issue. Mm -hmm. Sure. Seems, seems to be getting better. You're in a very fraught time politically where there's a lot of push and pull. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I tell you, if, if when I was a kid, I had seen anyone, any, like, we're talking 70s, 80s. Yeah. The, the only gay people I had heard of were um, the butts of jokes in the backs of magazines. You know? For sure. Um, I felt like I was going to turn into one of these caricatures. Um, yeah. And, and if I didn't fit that, then I, then I just had to go into deep denial. Oh, absolutely. I got called a lesbian all throughout high school, like, oh, you lesbo, you lesbo. And I remember just like trying to find my identity in that and being terrified, you know, and it didn't need to be that way. And I do think it's about representation. Like that's how we got the language, frankly, the elder queers got out there and like said, here we are. And you can name us, I guess, if you want, you know, like. And uh, for me, at least, the neurodivergence uh, is, is another issue that's very similar. Mm. Um, I had bipolar disorder since I was born in ADHD, but the only thing I knew about either of them were jokes and bad caricatures on TV. And Absolutely. I, like, I didn't resemble those caricatures, so when I got to the point of asking what, what, what's wrong with me, I didn't have any answers. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I think sometimes online communities talk about glamorizing or romanticizing illness, and, and I think that's absolutely not the problem. No, no. <laughs> Learning that there are, are people like you and that they're having a life. It's I true. Well, and I also, too, um, that idea of what's wrong with you. Now, I'm not going to say that's always incorrect to to say, but I also think that it can be damaging, you know, like I, I definitely think that's the mentality that I hope we're moving away from a little bit. This idea that being divergent mentally is wrong. I don't feel that way, but I admit when it comes to that kind of topic, I am super lucky to already be extremely radical in my thoughts because I'm disabled. And this idea of being normal was just never attainable, never. And I do admit that that has been so helpful in certain regards of life in that, like at 17, when I decided I'm not gay, I'm not straight, I'm not going to decide. That was easy. That was just, okay, I'm not going to be normal in that way. And that's okay. Same thing with like my looks. Um, now, don't get me wrong, I, I, when I was a teenager, when I was a young adult, I definitely think I had, uh, you know, downfalls. I definitely had things I felt bad about myself, but like I have never suffered or been close to suffering from say body dysmorphia simply because I am already so atypical in terms of what's accepted as beautiful that it just wasn't, um, wasn't a concern of mine. It wasn't on the top of my agenda because I just learned really quickly it was a waste of my time. But I'm grateful for that. Like, I don't know how else to put it, but that being disabled taught me that very early and I'm grateful for it. And I, in terms of representation, it kind of goes back to that too, because I feel like that gratitude is not something I really found until like my early thirties. And if I think about it, it's because like 
representation when I was, you know, young in the 90s and I was disabled, you were around. They didn't show that, I mean, unless it was like a telethon, you know, like the Shriners telethon or, um, you know, something like that. It, it, that was my representation for a very many, many years. And there's no glamour in that, unfortunately, you know, at least it, there wasn't back in that day. It was all about feeling sorry for people. So I, I, in terms of representation, that's what in regards to disability, don't feel sorry for me. It's just a big old waste of time. Cause I'm going to tell you what, I don't, that's not me. I don't feel bad for me at all for being disabled. Like turns out I got over that already. So let's move on. <laughs> yeah, I think for a lot of um, invisible disabilities, mm -hmm. uh, re representation can be hard. Uh, oh yeah. Like I also autistic and never would have guessed that about myself because all I knew was Rain Man. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and that's oh yeah. Not me. And then um, it's getting better, but there are a lot of like assumed autistic people. Like, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's so much, um, again, in the discourse, a, a lot of autistic people have to self-identify because getting a, a, a proper diagnosis is just not attainable to everybody. Yeah. Sometimes it's not a good idea. Um, oh, totally. There, there are reasons you do not want official paperwork that says they're autistic. Um, yeah. And, and if you don't need accommodations, then then there's no real value in, in professional diagnosis. But learning that about yourself oh, say, yeah. is super valuable because now I can understand why is this thing about me that no one else seems to do? And, mm -hmm. and then I can talk to other people that have that same experience. Like, how do you deal with that? You know, and and then I can go on and find people who find joy in being autistic. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and and I I and I can follow along there. And I, I came very late in life to this understanding about myself. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's in many ways it's a great time to be alive, and in many ways it's a heartbreaking time to be alive. So true. You know, it's so interesting to go off of that mental divergence part, like uh, even that in terms of being disabled, I really do hope like the combination of me, I guess, of, of my disorders or disorders, um, I hope that they look better than they seem to be when I first learned about them. And like, like, for instance, like, I can't even tell you how long it took me to be properly diagnosed with trauma which is so funny, um, really, because when you think about it, like a disabled person grew up in a hospital, it's not that hard to put together. And yet for so many years, I was incorrectly diagnosed with major depression. Um, and it's just because they always assume you have a disability, that's really depressing, you know? And so it was one of those things that for years and years and years, I didn't have the proper guidance, you know, to really get myself out of certain mental states. And it had so much to do with just like stereotypes that don't apply to me, that never applied to me. And I do think representation is huge, huge in that. I mean, just like in the disabled world, the past couple of years have been insanely awesome. Like social media, don't get me wrong. Social media is not always great. In many ways, it's not my bag of tea. But I cannot deny people with disabilities, oh, they out there now. You, you can see them. They're very happy, you know, and they're cool. They're so cool. They're way cooler than I ever felt that I was when I was a teenager. And that does not escape me. You know, like if I had just been able to look at someone else and been like, oh, I am cool, right on. <laughs> and, and not just the subject of a, a very special and heart-wrenching and brave <laughs> episode of, of some TV show. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, you I don't know, know if they still do those or not, but they used to be. You know, it's actually become pretty, um, like they've taken a step back, I'll say and really try to decide how they want to 
uh, portray people with disabilities in that regard now. Um, I think that media has really decided that the whole sympathetic inspiration porn route is not the way to go anymore. <laughs> And so that's really great because I do think we're getting a lot more honest stories than we ever did. Um, and that's, I, it's valuable in ways too that are hard to pinpoint because like when I think about my representation as a child, I don't even wanna say his name, but I will for this sake. The first time I saw someone cool with a disability on TV was in a Marilyn Manson video. I mean, and that's just the truth, you know? And don't get me wrong, that I think that was Lady Bunny, and she is fucking awesome. Yeah, um, Lady she's Bunny is definitely awesome. Right? She's just, she was incredible, so intense and just wonderful to look at. And I saw her, and it was like, oh yeah, there it is. This is it. This is this is what gets me out of inspiration. <laughs> I gotta scare people now, you know. But it was that representation that it just gave me, um, it gave me a sense of myself, I guess, that I didn't know I was missing. And so now I look at the representation out there and it's way beyond the world of horror. And that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Like, don't get me wrong. I don't care for rom-coms at all, but I am so stoked to see the rom-com about disabled people. I really am. <laughs> Uh, which, what is that? Oh, I don't know. Just the theoretical oh, you're one that's probably coming out. <laughs> yeah, well, let's let's hope. I I mean, we we deserve trashy TV too. Oh, totally. Oh, there it is. That's where that's where I will pop. I'm ready for my own reality TV show because I'm telling you, I have content every single day that I go out in the world and do my thing in my scooter. I am producing absolutely entertaining content that someone should be filming so there's that idea to whoever decides to pick that up <laughs> and that there is um the, the topic of intersectionality the, the the folks that are opposed to diversity and representation oh mm -hmm. weird thing that there are people that are opposed to it it really it, they mock, have to close their eyes <laughs> yeah. they'll they'll mock by saying well what's next a a, a lesbian disabled um, you know and just sort of list these qualities like well yeah i know that person yeah it's like yeah probably I, i've yeah. met them you know yeah you, you can be more than one thing at once and uh and absolutely have more than one interesting person in the story mm -hmm. My, there can be multiple heroes and they don't have to wear capes <laughs> Right. And, and there is absolutely a tendency of the weirdos to find each other. Mm -hmm. so, oh, the counterculture saved me. Yeah. Like in, in Salt Lake City, especially. Um, I mean, so when I was a young disabled girl, the society I knew was Relief Society, who would come knocking on my door to make the little disabled girl the project for the week, you know? And of course, I didn't realize that till I was older, but it was finding the complete opposite of that in the counterculture, in Rocky Horror Picture Show, in the haunted house scene, in the true weirdos. Like, that's where I truly found freedom. Like, the counterculture really did save me. Uh, and, and I think Utah has a strong counterculture in part because the mainstream culture is so homogenous. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be very weird to be a weirdo to them. Oh, totally. Like, it, it's not hard. Long hair as a man and you're an outcast, you know? You're mm -hmm. going to get side-eye at the very least. Polite. Mostly very, very polite. Yes. They'll be judging you. You know, funny enough with that, so I've been with my same partner, a man, for um, nine years now almost. And he is from a small town in Virginia. <laughs> And when we first were dating um, and really getting serious, I remember he wanted to take me home to meet his family. And I had this moment of panic that I can only relate to, unfortunately, as like the same as like a black person where I was like, well, you got to tell your mom first. And he's like, tell her what? And I was like, 
you need to tell her I'm disabled. At this time, I was very cis female. I mean, I was like long hair, um, lots of traditional makeup, you know, like the only weird thing about me was I was disabled, but it was weird enough, you know? And now as we've been dating over the course of nine years, that weirdo has evolved into more and more weirdo. She keeps losing her hair. You know, she, uh, she is not exactly a she anymore. So what does that mean? And his family, who is very conservative, um, I've just watched them have to like weather that storm, you know, because they like me. <laughs> they already got to know me, but like I, it's so funny, the different levels of weirdo, whereas back in the day, I, I used to consider myself pretty normal looking, but I was still a weirdo, you know? So like, it's weird, the levels of progression. And at that point, I do also say what exactly is normal. Like, it's so weird, this idea of normal. I don't know who invented it. Um, probably the Greeks. <laughs> I'm going to blame the Greeks. They, they, they were seem... very weird, though. <laughs> they, they were uh, from modern view, but they, they were also where a lot of the black and white divisions of this versus that uh, started to really come into Western culture. I guess that's true. And uh, fuck that. I was going to say, I mean, I think back in the day, they just threw my kind into a, a big old pit. Like, see ya. And I mean, I do... It's funny for me to think about that as well, because like in regards to a weirdo, I think it can be easy to drop into kind of like this dismissive attitude, almost like I'm a weirdo and um, I, you know, I'm not accepted and it's just the way it is and blah, blah, blah. I kind of look at it as like, granted, I'm a weirdo and that I'm disabled. Same thing with being queer, gay people. You need, we used to just kill those people, you know? We, we used to just get rid of them. And so I try to keep that in mind sometimes with society now, where it's like, yeah, Karen's saying some shit. Karen's got some shit to say, and that sucks. But Karen can't kill me, so. Well, I mean, maybe she could, but it looked really bad. Yeah, um, and it depends on what era, era of history. I mean, I think you mm -hmm. and I both would have wound up in a Victorian asylum. Totally, um, right? We yeah. probably would have been friends still. Probably, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, a bit farther back, perhaps stoned to death or something like that. But if we get out of Europe or, or go even further back than that, um, we might both have been revered as, as people with, with um, extra wisdom. Because Very interesting. Yeah. Strangeness. Um, I, I actually encountered a Hindu man once who, uh, he used to work the drive through at the gas station that I would go to. Like he would sell me beer through the drive through cause I was disabled and he, uh, he was always incredibly kind to me. He would give me gifts. He gave me a Christmas card and, and just like, it was the most bizarre thing. I did feel almost like worshiped. And I remember like at a certain point, I like was kind of weirded out, but like I was curious. And I remember asking him like, you know, you're so nice to me. You're always just so nice to me. You've given me Christmas gifts, like why? And he explained to me, he's like, well, you're a God. Like in our culture back in the day, I mean, with what you look like, you've clearly done something um, in a lifetime that you went to war you know, or something, some, some, something like that. I'm sure I'm getting the cultural story wrong. But the point was he viewed me as this goddess, as this creature to be worshiped. And it was nothing like I'd ever encountered in my life. And I truly think that's sad kind of about America. But at the same time, I do hope that's what's changing a little bit with social media. Because like the difference is in his culture, you take a person with a deformity or a disability you display them, you, you know, look how beautiful they are. And in America, that's not been the case up until now. Like TikTok, I'll give it, it's not the most intelligent platform necessarily, but it has given a lot of diversity to this social media thing, you know? 
what I'd like most to hear from you now is what advice do you have for the weirdos coming up right now? Hmm. So what advice would I give to a weirdo coming up right now? Um, I would probably tell them honestly that it's okay not to know exactly what kind of weirdo you are, that, uh, you'll swim through the stream just fine anyway. And if you don't, there's probably another weirdo who will come and help you out anyway. Um, like that would be my biggest advice is, is just uh, with being a weirdo, it is a broad term for a reason because you don't need to have all the answers at this time. So that's what I would say. Yeah, find the other weirdos. Yeah, or they'll find you. Yeah. You know, you may not be able to find people who are your exact flavor of weirdo. And if you've got a combo pack, then then probably not. Find yeah, other, other weirdos, and they're not going to be perfect. And sometimes there are assholes who are in the community, but um, at least there'll be assholes to you for reasons other than what you are. <laughs> it's true, and also too. I mean, I admit I'm a pesky weirdo. That if you're an asshole to me, there's a good chance I'll be like, okay. You just don't like me yet. It's okay. I'll give you time. And it usually just does take a little time. So. <laughs> All right. Well, Amanda fucking do so. Thank you for talking to us. Here. Of course. Thanks for having me. Here comes the weirdo parade. Um, and if I can find a clip from Rocky Horror Picture Show or something, I'm going to play it at the, at the end. Okay. My name is Amanda fucking do so. Uh, also known tonight as MC Krim. There will be conversations with myself. There will be expeditions for my neck. God bless you all. God save the king. I love that you're doing this project, like posterity for the weirdos. <laughs> right. Huh? Yeah. Um, we leave our mark while we're around to help other weirdos further along the line. Yeah. And to help us find each other. I, I do hope some folks will, will watch the series and go, oh, hey, that's someone I need to know. You know for that's sure. That's someone I need to look up. Or possibly that's someone I need to pay money to.